Hey everybody, Josh Aluzo here from Sunburn Encounters. I'm just going to jump right in. Um, the gospel will cost you your life, your entire life. And I'm going to talk about endurance and trials, loving the unlovely, and the example that Jesus set. And I start reading out of James chapter 1, verse... Two. It says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let the endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Whenever I read this, I always found it weird that, that they transition. In verse 5, they sort of transition into lacking wisdom. We were just talking about endurance, and I never, I never understood this. But then I heard one day my old pastor from King of Kings Church in, in uh, New Jersey, he said concerning the Sermon on the Mount, he said the Sermon on the Mount is not Jesus' greatest hits. They're in succession. They actually go together. It's, it's one big teaching and it all goes together. And so here, uh, likewise, with, with wisdom and endurance, these two go hand in hand. Now, biblically, wisdom is a trait of the experienced. And usually in the Bible, uh, wisdom and experience is always more or less referred to older people. The wi they're, they're wiser, they're older, they have more life experience. And rightfully so, because other places biblically, uh, youth is associated with foolishness. And that's just, that's just the way it is. However, it's accurate, but however, it's not exclusive to, uh, wisdom is not exclusive to men and women of old age because uh, biblically or experientially, I mean, I know 50-year-old people who are stuck in a sort of a, a teenage mindset, but uh, nevertheless, I still give them respect. You're, you're called to res respect your elders. <laughs> you're called to respect your elders because they do have life, more life experience, so it's unwise for you to judge anybody, you know. But biblically, it's, it's accurate. It's not accurate to, um, well, let's put it this way. Biblically, Paul encourages Timothy to not let anyone look down on him for his age. Timothy was called to lead by example. In the same way that Paul was led, uh, by, as an, led by Jesus, he, he watched him, he followed him, he imitated him. And in all those ways, we're called to be imitators and to be an example to the rest of the world. Consider it pure joy. Joy in the midst of trials is a sign of maturity. It's a sign of wisdom. It's a sign of experience. The words, the key words that pop out in that verse to me is consider and knowing. These words, consider and knowing, they have like this wisdom, mindset, thought patterns, uh, sort of lingo. They, they sound like you have to put thought into this. Consider it pure joy when faced with trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or endurance. So you have to be able to step outside of yourself and consider everything that's coming your way. You have to be able to evaluate everything and consider what this is. What is this really? When trials come your way, when testings come your way, you have to be able to see it for what they really are and know. Experientially. You can't, it's got to be a knowing in your heart. You can't just... You have to see everything the way it is and know experientially that if you are steadfast in the will of God, this will turn out. Whatever comes your way, whatever trial comes, various trials, the Bible says, various trials. However they may come, you have to know that this here will turn out for my benefit and for the benefit of the world around me. Like, 
That's true maturity, actually. Doing what's right for the sake of others. That's actually putting on love, really. If, you, if, if, and again, like I said, you have to be in the will of God. It says everything works together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. If I'm truly in His will, and I'm not in this for, this, for myself, I'm not being selfish, these trials will work for my good and for the good of everyone around me. Now in 2 Corinthians 4, it's another chapter, I highly recommend everybody read this entire chapter. <laughs> it's so powerful. But I can't read the whole thing right now. I'm just going to start at verse... Seven. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power of God will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always caring about in our body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. For we, well, for, for we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal bodies. So death works in us, but life works in you. That's powerful. That's not selfish. But one, the, the main verse I want to jump to is, uh, 16 and 17, really. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But th though our outer man is decaying, yet the inner man is being renewed day by day. For these, verse 17, for these momentary light afflictions are producing in us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That is an imitator of Christ right there, Paul. He is an imitator. He is not drawn by outward temporal things. He's, he's a man who's steadfast in spirit. He's, he's led by someone greater than himself, and he knows it. Uh, he has eternity in mind. He has his eyes fixed on eternity. He's not temporal. He's not earthbound. He's not focused on the earth. Set your mind on things above, the Bible says. He, and, and Paul's not the only example, by the way. There's many people who do this. He's just the example right now, biblically. He carried many burdens from every direction, and he, he's been given the strength and the grace to do so. He, he doesn't get it from himself. It's not worked up. You don't work it up. You will not work up endurance to endure the race, the, uh, the, the, the path set before you, the way. You can't just do it on your own. It's not self-will. It's not something that you can do. He sees things differently. Your eye has to be changed. You have to have this new holy perspective on life. And it has to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. He has eternity in mind. He has the Spirit of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit, and is moved with compassion for the souls of the people, just like Jesus. And that leads to an astounding characteristic that Jesus possessed. Uh, and I long to be perfected in. Is is summed up in a sentence where Jesus says, love your enemies. In Matthew 5, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus shows that we're not just called to love those who love us back, but true love never stops loving, period. Even if, they hate, even if the people that you're loving hate you in return, you're called to keep loving them. And Matthew 5, verse 3, 43 says, You've heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. Interestingly, I'll just stop right here for a sec. Jesus, it, it seems sort of contrary to the way the world works. It should be like, sun rises on the righteous and not on the unrighteous. They deserve this. They deserve that. But that's not how God loves. That's not how He loves. And there's a lot of controversy in there because a lot of people aren't perfected in love. I'm not saying I am either. But 
we've got a way to go. There's one who was perfected in love. For, verse 46, For if you love those who love you only, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same thing. And if you only greet your brothers, what more are you doing than anyone else? Come on, anybody can love their friends or their family. Anyone can greet people that they know and love. But Jesus takes us a step further. He's calling you to love those. He's calling you to love the unlovely. Those who, whom you know, who, who, don't, who are hating you without a cause. I'm going to quote this book, uh, this book I've been reading called The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And um, he said, the only way to overcome our enemy is to love them. And I, I, I didn't put this down, but Martin Luther King said a very similar thing. It's actually a lot, it's very powerful itself. He says, hate um, cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And so, who is our enemy? Who is the one that we're called to love like this? We're called to love our enemies, bless our enemies, but who are they? You know, our enemy is the one who hates us. Not that we, not, there's nobody, and this is, this is, Jesus has, does not tolerate this. Anybody that we just, just dislike or, or are hostile towards, he doesn't tolerate that. In that case, there's actually, we have no enemies. We should not have anybody that we just dislike for no reason. That's, that put Jesus on the cross. They hated me without cause. We should never hate without cause. Never, ever, ever. This is to Christians and non-Christians alike. Part two of endurance. You don't, just, it, you don't just patiently endure and wait and suffer and hope to get into heaven and you just bear all these things. There's a second part to this. Like I said, Jesus takes this a step further. He says, he says that you are called to actively engage in heartfelt love towards your enemies. You're called to love them. You're not called to just deal with them. You're called to love your enemies. And that's not to condone the principalities and the powers and the evil that's behind all that. We just know that people aren't the true enemy. We just know the real deal. We know that these people are made in the image of God. I'm called to love them. Even if they've been overcome and possessed and, and just really just, just influenced by the rest of the world around them, they are not wicked. We're called to love them. Why? Oh, no, not why. Excuse me. I don't know why I said why. <laughs> just love your enemies. Sin by nature makes us hostile towards God. We were his enemies. This has been rocking me lately. We are, by nature, enemies of God. Sin is in opposition of his holiness. He is God, so he's holy. There's no way around it. God doesn't make, like, like he doesn't change his mind from Old Testament to New Testament. He's still just as holy, if not even holier. But there's this, there's this dispute, and I'm not going to get into that. But the point is, it's like, our sin nature is the th what sin does. It fights against the very one who wants to save your life and set you free. That's what sin does. In Romans 5, I'm not going to go there, but it says that while we were, you know what? I am going to go there. We have to go there. Romans 5, verse 8 says that God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. This is the key verse, verse 10. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through His death, through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We were His enemies, and He loved us. It was unqualified love, unconditional. We were not so, while we were ungodly, He demonstrated His love. This is the love of God, dying for the ungodly and the unlovely, and just making a way for them to live. Finally, this is, this is the 
this is what Jesus did. This is the example that he set for us. We're called to follow him. If you're a Christian, as a Christian, if you're watching this and you're a Christian, as a Christian, we are called to be like our masters. Our master, excuse me. We are his disciples. Jesus said, nobody's greater than their master. If they persecute me, they also will persecute you. So we're called to follow him in this way of endurance and in trials and in perils and perplexed and hard-pressed on every side. We're called to go through this. And we're also called to love our neighbors even in the midst of rejection and hatred. Like, look, I'm not, I'm not amped up or pumped up about suffering. I don't desire to suffer. No discipline seems right at the moment. But I'm saying if trials are going to come your way, Trials come to everybody on earth. I don't know if you've been on earth long enough to realize that. But trials come in life. And people don't like you and people hate you. Hate's going to come and trials are going to come. So we might as well rejoice and be exceedingly glad because great is our reward in heaven. In the, because, and also in the same way, the prophets before us were pu- persecuted. So we might, as well, we might as well just go for it. We might as well just do everything that Jesus said. Hey, If you don't have that love, I'm going to read one more verse and then I'm going to pray for that love because I want it too. I am not perfected in it, but I want it. I'm longing for it. See, that's the thing. That's all you need. You just need to long for it. Jesus, a broken and contrite heart, he will not despise. He's looking for someone. He's, He's near He's near to the brokenhearted. He's close to the needy. If you want this, if you believe that you need this, then you'll pray, you'll pray along with me. But let me read this verse quick. It's in Philippians 3, ver- verse 10. Real quick, Jesus says, come follow me, follow him. We're called to walk in his ways and in his lifestyle, and we're to fellowship with him and in his sufferings. Philippians 3 verse 10 says, Oh, that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Hmm. How do you respond to Him today? How do you respond to Him today? Are you going to give up are you gonna? Are you gonna? Are you gonna press on? He says, "I press on. I I I fellowship in His sufferings, Father. I ask, and I ask right now that you would just pray pray along with me in your own way. Are you willing to take up this new life, the God, this gospel life? This is this gospel. It's 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 for Christians and non Christians alike. A lot of times we even." Uh, as Christians, we won't even fulfill it to the fullest. And Paul even said in verse 12, he says, Not that I've already obtained it or have uh, become perfect, but I press on to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. So, Father, I ask right now that you would fill each individual who's watching this video with a persevering, a pressing on, enduring in trials, not giving up when, when, the, when life speaks really loud with tragedies and rejections and sin that might so easily entangle in unbelief. Father, I ask that you would just give us a heart that would endure in love. Father, I ask that you would show us that we might know you. And Lord, we need your strength that works so mightily within us. I ask all this stuff in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you.